He said, fine. We played, it was a lovely day. We all played well. And at the end of the game, we all sort of clapped each other on the back and the Americans said, well, we're sorry we beat you. And the British captain said, I'm sorry we beat you. And that was a little bit of an incident because the Americans said they thought they'd won and we said we knew we'd won. And they said, well, what rules do you play by? And we said, our rules. As the Americans adapted to their new life, their colleagues told them about a mysterious and daunting code-breaking problem. They knew that in addition to Enigma, the Germans sometimes used another, completely different kind of cipher machine. Now we knew nothing about this cipher machine. It was kept completely secret by the Germans. And we first began to intercept radio transmissions in 1940. It was actually a group of policemen on the south coast of England, and they were listening for, uh, for German agent transmissions from within the UK. Of course, there weren't any, because we'd captured all the agents. But they were still listening for these, and they heard these weird signals, and they sent them to Bletchley Park. At first, the decoders puzzled over the origin of the strange signals. Hitler had demanded a cipher machine for the German high command that was faster and even more secure than the Enigma. His experts devised a coding system based on the teleprinter machine. Teleprinters operated on a simple, universal binary code that was widely known. But the Germans connected the teleprinter to a machine that cunningly exploited the teleprinter language itself to produce a complex code. The secret German coding machine was called the Lorenz. To scramble a message, the Lorenz used 12 rotors, not just the three or four of the Enigma. The Lorenz machine transmits a string of letters, each one of which is actually a mix of the real letter, of the real message, and a piece of machine-crafted gobbledygook, that a machine being of diabolically complex craftiness. So at the end of it, what comes out and goes over the ether and is transmitted is a single string of total gobbledygook. The Lorenz relied on a mathematical system called Modulo 2 Addition. This allowed the string of meaningless letters added to the message at one end to be removed at the other by a similar math calculation. The operator presses a key on his teleprinter. That generates an electrical signal. The Lorenz machine then adds an obscuring character to this signal and the result is then transmitted. At the other end of the link, another Lorentz machine, set to exactly the same configuration, regenerates exactly the same obscuring character, adds it back to the ciphertext, and by the magic of modulo 2 arithmetic, they cancel out and leave you with the plain text. The security of the Lorenz depended on the fact that it was adding a string of random letters to hide the real message. But because it's a machine, it can't generate a completely random set of letters. It's what's known as pseudo-random. Unfortunately for Germans, it was more pseudo than random, and that's how it was broken. Bletchley Park gave the mysterious code the name FISH. They worked out that FISH was based on teleprinter language. How to strip off the obscuring code was anybody's guess. But on the 30th of August, 1941, a lazy German operator gave the whole game away. When he got to the end of keying in this nearly 4,000 character message by hand, the operator at receiving end sent back in German the equivalent of, didn't get that, send it again. 
And then, like idiots, they both put their Lorentz cipher machines back to the same start position. And then he began to key this long message again. When the operator began to encode the same message a second time, he grew impatient and abbreviated parts of it. The resulting slight changes enabled the code breakers to strip off the random letters that were cloaking the message. For me, the real excitement was this business of getting these two texts out of one sequence of gibberish. It was marvelous. Never, never met anything that was quite as exciting, especially since you knew that these were vital messages. Now that they had decoded the message, could they use it to figure out exactly how the Lorenz machine worked? For the next two months, the code breakers hunted laboriously for patterns in the endless strings of obscuring letters. Eventually, they were able to reconstruct the precise mechanics of the Lorenz, a machine they had never seen. They even built their own replica. Since it was used to crack the mysterious fish code, they called the replica Tunny, after a fish in the tuna family. Once the Lorenz settings were found, Tunny could turn the messages into plain German. Despite the advances in understanding fish, it still took at least a month to decode a single message, and by then the information was generally useless. It was a curious life. It involved mental gymnastics, and it could be, could be very wearing, particularly if you didn't succeed. I mean, you could spend nights in which you got nowhere at all. You didn't get a single break. You just tried, played around, played around through this bleak long night with total frustration. And your brain felt literally raw. Your psyche or whatever it is felt frustrated, but your brain almost literally felt raw at the end of it. But the whole process was about to be speeded up. At the post office research station in London, a brilliant young telephone engineer hit upon the idea of an electronic machine that would automate the hunt for the fish settings. The machine would be nothing less than the world's first programmable computer. I uh, tried to tell Patricia Park what, the, uh, what my ideas were, but you must understand that the uh, technology that I was using was, uh, was then only just known to very few people in the whole world. Though the code breakers were skeptical, Flowers was convinced the answer lay in vacuum tubes, hundreds of them. Tommy Flowers started in March 1943 with a blank sheet of paper, never been done before, I mean, Flowers was thinking of a machine with 1,500 valves in it. The biggest machine ever at that time had 150 valves in it, so this was an enormous leap into the dark. But Flowers was convinced it could, he could make it work, and nobody else was, but he was. And so he started, more or less off his own bat. We just told people to do things. We had the power, we had the authority to tell anybody. You know, we had the first priority in the whole country for everything. And we could just tell people what we wanted and not tell them what it was for. Over Christmas 1943, Tommy Flowers installed the world's first programmable computer at Bletchley Park. Eventually, ten more were built, all dedicated to analyzing the secret messages of the German High Command. They were given the name Colossus. Colossus could read a coded message at high speed and then search for the settings of the Lorenz code wheels.